We're going to talk about exchange rates, foreign exchange, sometimes abbreviated as FX. For this class, we're always going to define the exchange rate as units of foreign currency per US dollar. We'll always keep the US dollar in the denominator. When you ex see exchange rates out in the wild, sometimes they'll flip the dollar to numerator or denominator. For instance, you might see 140 Japanese yen equal to one dollar but then $1.07 per one euro. Those flip the position of the dollar. But here, to keep things simple, we will always keep the dollar in the denominator. So instead of $1.07 per euro, we'd say 0.93 euro to the dollar. Later on, enough different formulas go flying around. We want to keep the notation as straightforward as possible. The foreign exchange markets are huge, something over $5 trillion notional traded per day. The decisions of us little people are not going to impact those sums. The foreign exchange rates change because of supply and demand for each currency in each pair. The supply of one currency is demand for another. I can't just supply dollars to the market without creating a demand for Japanese yen or euro or rupee or whatever other currency. Similarly for other actors, they supply their currency and demand another, usually dollars. The US dollar is far and away the most important currency for global trade. When we use the exchange rate in a formula, it's always unit of foreign exchange FX per dollar. So as we said, if we're talking about yen, E equals 140 means 140 yen per dollar. One of the reasons to keep the dollar in the denominator is we can clearly say that as E rises, that's the dollar appreciating, gaining value. If E falls, then that's dollar depreciating, losing value. It's vice versa for the foreign currency. As the dollar appreciates against the yen at the same time, that must mean the yen depreciates against the dollar. And vice versa, if the dollar is depreciating against the yen, that means the yen is appreciating against the dollar. They move in opposite directions. One gets stronger, the other gets weaker. It's a zero-sum game. If E goes from 140 to 130, then that's dollar depreciation, because the dollar is buying fewer yen. Or it's the yen appreciating, because it takes fewer yen to buy one dollar. It's always confusing. But that's why we want to keep the definition of E fixed as units of foreign currency per dollar. And to head off any later questions or concerns, students wonder if there's any impact at all that some currencies have hundreds of units in the dollar and other currencies have less than one unit in the dollar. It doesn't really matter. Not to anything. It doesn't make any difference. Who is participating in these foreign exchange markets? The big groups are firms trading goods and services between the countries. Those are obviously big. Tourists visiting foreign countries. Investors buying ownership in foreign firms. And investors buying financial portfolios. If a U.S. firm is exporting, for instance, a manufacturer selling machinery to some foreign country, then they're going to have revenues in that foreign exchange currency, but their costs are in domestic currency. Vice versa, something like a Chinese firm selling in the U.S. is going to have revenues in dollars, costs in renminbi. They're both going to want to supply one currency and demand another. Tourists similarly are going to supply their home currency and demand foreign exchange. For foreign direct investment, we can dif distinguish among at least two principal types. Foreign direct investment versus portfolio investment. Foreign direct investment, FDI, is purchasing ownership, at least in part, in another com company in another country, with an aim to create a new organization or to expand. Whereas portfolio investment is purely financial. It's sometimes called hot money because it can easily and quickly reverse. Someone who buys 100 shares in some foreign country, a uh, company, can then sell those later in the same day if they change their mind. Whereas FDI is much less liquid. If I've entered in a joint venture with a foreign company or bought a factory or set up a research facility, can't get out of that the same day. If a company knows they'll be paid euro in six months, they can lock in a price today. 
That helps companies they can lock in their profit for the transaction. Not worry if exchange rates move against them. There are options and swaps and many more exotic things out there. Some of those exist because firms genuinely have complicated financial transactions and want to make sure they're not exposed to foreign exchange risk. A U.S. manufacturer likely has no useful opinion on whether foreign exchange rates will go up and down. They want to lock in a rate since many of their costs are already paid. That's hedging. They want to hedge against a real position. But there are reasons to be in those financial markets, including arbitrage or speculate. Hedgers are the ones who want to plan ahead. Arbitrageurs are those who want to keep the multitude of exchange rates on target. If the rates were not correct, then it might be possible to change, I don't know, renminbi to yen, to euro, to great British pounds, to dollars, back to renminbi, and make a profit. If those rates are not all essentially correct, then, you know, it could be possible. And there are hundreds of currencies out there, lots of different maturities, so lots of numbers that all have to be kept in line. Arbitrageurs, those these days mostly computer programs, are going to keep those on target. Then there are speculators who try to profit from their predictions about what's going to happen in those markets. Gamblers, in another word. I mean, sometimes they might have an edge, some vig, but at the end they're gambling on what's going to happen in the future. Now what happens when exchange rates move? As the dollar appreciates, what happens to U.S. exporters? A U.S. product that costs 100 bucks to make, now as the dollar appreciates, that's going to cost more in foreign countries. Depending on the elasticity, effect might be bigger or smaller, but they will sell less since demand curves slope downward. That's usually bad for U.S. exporters. As the dollar appreciates, what does that mean for imports? A product that cost 100 of the foreign currency is now going to cost fewer dollars. Or another way of saying the same dollar price buys more foreign exchange. One way or another, those imports look cheaper. It's a bit weird that people might say they want a strong dollar, because maybe that sounds good. But a strong dollar is appreciating in value. As the dollar appreciates, the trade deficit gets worse. Exports go down, imports go up. Trade deficit worse. The politicians often kind of dance around that. They understand that people who aren't well informed think it sounds good to have strong things. A strong economy, strong job markets, and a strong dollar. But a strong dollar is bad for the trade deficit. If they want U.S. exports to rise and imports to fall, a weak dollar is better for that. But politicians, as we know, are not always the smartest. Some of them might know better. If all the talk about foreign exchange is confusing you, don't worry. It is genuinely confusing, but we'll figure it out.